Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to Marianopolis College for inviting me. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, it's very exciting to see uh, such a wide variety of uh, age groups, uh, starting from our young uh, attendee to all of you guys uh, uh, attending this general talk, which I will be uh, uh, presenting today on electric vehicles. I know it's a very cool and sexy topic. Um, quite a few, I'm sure, uh, understand that uh, the need of the hour is for sustainable transportation, okay? The transportation industry is the number one industry uh, which consumes oil, okay? How many of you are aware of that? I'm sure each of us owns a car, okay? Every one of us at least owns some kind of vehicle, all right? Um, so definitely, uh, if you multiply that with the population of North America in general, uh, you can see that North America is the number one um, consumer of oil. And not to mention India and China are growing very rapidly in economy and uh, cars being sold there. Now, uh, people in the eastern countries want to live like uh, the West, okay? So, uh, considering the population in uh, eastern countries uh, and considering that each one wants to live a Western lifestyle, uh, the problem is very serious. Okay, now those of you who want to go into engineering, <clears throat> this is an option. Renewable energy uh, and electric vehicles, sustainable transportation. Uh, as uh, as uh, Michelle introduced, uh, my areas of uh, interest uh, include uh, some of these topics and also power electronics and motor drives. Uh, as you can see, I'm affiliated with the Power Electronics and Energy Research Group. Uh, as the name suggests, we integrate energy-related activities with a lot of electronics and how electronics can help us uh, build these uh, sustainable systems for renewable energies as well as electric vehicles, okay? So today's talk, I'll give you a brief introduction uh, to electric vehicles, okay? Where the auto industry in general is heading in the future, okay? What is available right now? What is happening in terms of research? Uh, how electric vehicles can be integrated with renewable energy systems, okay? Uh, everybody knows that solar energy, uh, wind energy, uh, fuel cells, and hydrogen economy, people keep talking about uh, all of these fancy topics and how it can uh, replace the electricity grid, okay, to help uh, power homes uh, or to uh, uh, power industries, okay? What I will be talking about is how these renewable energy sources can be integrated with electric cars, Okay, because all of us will own electric cars at some point moving forward, okay, with the dearth of oil supply. Okay, so therefore the title is an <clears throat> of the talk is entitled Electric Vehicles Plugging into a Greener Energy Efficient Future. Okay, so the title really envelops the summary of uh, or the abstract of what I just said. All right, so uh, I'll keep the uh, try and keep the talk very general, not too technical. Okay, so that uh, I know it's afternoon and after lunch and not to bore you and put you to sleep, okay? So here's the problem. The first and foremost slide, I, I like to present this slide at all times. This slide comes from the Department of Energy in the United States, okay? So here's your um, price in US dollars per liter uh, for oil, okay? So this is the gas price trends in North America at the pump currently, okay? And this is in US dollars per liter. So as you can see, as the years have gone by, these prices are exponentially increasing, okay? So there's a 20% trend increase, there's a 15% trend in the green plot, and the pink plot shows you a 10% trend, okay? So this is from a conservative approach to a more realistic approach, okay? Currently, we are in the range of about 15 to 20% increase, okay? And all, most of you, in fact, would know about uh, the, uh, the, the problems and the atrocities that is happening in the Middle East and the fight over oil, okay? So this trend is in fact uh, very, very uh, conservative, okay? A 20% increase is, uh, is a realistic view. However, this is only bound to increase in the future, near future, okay? This is the usage, okay? As of 2009 or more recently, you can see the usage of transportation industry. 67% of the oil that is produced is consumed by the trans transportation uh, sector, okay? Electric, uh, I'm talking about conventional cars, gasoline or diesel cars, okay? 
gasoline or diesel is extracted from crude oil. Okay, so 67, almost 70 percent of the oil that is produced is actually um, consumed by the transportation industry alone. Okay, so that's a big chunk of the pie, as you can see. So um, all these uh, factors lead to uh, a, a big dilemma. Okay, more recently we are facing this dilemma of uh, cost versus uh, production of oil. Okay, now here's the market. Why do we need a sustainable transportation research environment in universities and colleges? Okay, uh, why are we teaching these subjects? Why, why do uh, students like you uh, and, and, and humans in general, like you and me, need to know about this technology? Well, just look at the market. Starting from 1960, this is the sales of vehicles in millions, okay? Sales of cars in millions. Okay, in 1960, we see it was about 20 million cars sold in North America alone, all right? As the trend won by in 2010, you can see we're reaching almost 100 million, 80 to 100 million range of cars. Okay, so now let's see, uh, uh, let's say that each car on an average costs about $20,000. $20,000 a car, it's an average range, okay? Maybe 22 to 25, maybe more realistic. Even say conservatively, we say it's 20,000 a car, okay? You multiply by 60 million cars, okay? I can't even know, count this number. You see the market in dollars, okay? I can't even count the number of zeros here. All right, that's how big the market is, the auto industry, okay? And consider that these are all gasoline or diesel driven cars in North America alone, okay? Multiply this number by about five to eight times, you will get the Chinese and the Indian sectors of, uh, of auto industry, okay? So that's a huge number, okay? And those countries, uh, are not really working on renewable energy systems right now, okay? So really there's a big problem. The oil supply is limited, okay? While the demand is increasing exponentially, okay? So here's another motivational slide. If not for any better reason to do research, at least this slide should convince us that there is a very dire need for engineers to work on electric cars, right? Okay, with his permission, I'll move on to the next slide. All right. Um, so here's about break even, where we broke even about year 2000, after which the oil usage has been uh, steadily increasing. Just to give you a rough idea, around year 2000, we have already passed the uh, uh, break even point, okay? The demand right now is more than the supply of oil, okay? So there's a big transportation gap there. The other point of view, uh, if you want a, a motivational uh, factor, is emissions, okay? Gasoline cars and diesel cars emit harmful uh, emissions, okay? So this is uh, carbon, carbon monoxide emissions as of year 2009, okay? So on-road vehicles produce about 60% of the harmful emissions, carbon monoxide. <clears throat> this is the percentage distribution of vehicle in, in North America, okay? Now, if you go on the road today, as of today, you will see that every third car is a minivan or an SUV. Do you agree with me? Have you ever noticed that? You might not have noticed it, okay? Now, if you are, uh, are more aware after this talk, go give it a shot, okay? If you don't see that every third car is a minivan or an SUV, give me a call, okay? I can guarantee you, on an average, every third car is a minivan or an SUV. You know what the problem is with that? What's the problem? It's a huge gas guzzler, okay? Minivans and SUVs are huge gas guzzlers, okay? And, and, and more often than not, you will see only one guy driving the car, okay? That's pretty lavish lifestyle, right? I mean, it's great, okay? But in today's day and age, that's a cardinal sin, okay? That's sinful. You just don't do that. Yes, you have a question? Maybe we'll take questions at the end of the lecture. Oh, he'll have to write down then. You'll remember? Okay, go ahead, yeah. 
I was just going to say that my family has a minivan and all, but I have, but as well as my parents, both my parents have also have a brother and a sister. Uh -huh. So our minivan doesn't use as much gas per person. Per person, okay, okay. If you have a big family, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, so write down your, you have a pen? Oh. Oh, hello. I'm a mom. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, so the red plot is basically what I'm trying to show you is every, every third car really is an SUV. Okay, it's a status symbol in, in uh, the US and in Canada. Uh, it's understandable. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, every family does own a minivan or an SUV, okay? But there's a fundamental problem in the sense that you're not going to have gas to fill it up very soon, okay? So we need to think of alternatives quickly. Now, here's the fact, okay? The first ever car that was ever made was an all-electric car. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was. When cars, when, when we thought of moving ourselves on the road, humans, the first car was an electric car. Okay, that's why I named this slide astonishingly true with three exclamation points. So what happened then? Why? Why all this business of uh, oil and uh, gasoline and diesel? See, this is the first ever car, okay, in the late 1800s. All electric. It, was, it had a DC motor. Okay, it worked off of DC current, DC, direct current versus alternating. Okay, you guys are familiar with that, right? So it used the DC motor. And this was the first car. It used a nice lead acid battery pack, and it drove the motor, and we went. It was silent, it was clean, okay, efficient. It didn't have a problem with uh, uh, fuel usage, fueling at the pump, etc. okay? However, what happened in the late, late 1800s, in the early uh, 1900s was that the need for comfort came into being. Okay, these cars were not very fast. Okay, honestly, electric cars, right at the beginning, they just moved you from point A to point B. That was great. Okay, it was a discovery at the time. They might have patented it. It was beautiful uh, invention. However, uh, you know, we are humans. We get greedy, right? We start uh, getting more demanding. We, with the, the demand for passing by, uh, zipping by fast, came into being, okay? We need more power at the wheel. So the gasoline engine was discovered, okay? The engine was discovered in the, in the 1900s, okay? And that replaced the electric motor on the automobile, all right? And that's what gave us the, the oomph factor, okay? And so we could uh, replace that uh, electric motor, the little electric motor in the car with a gasoline engine. And now we had a more energy dense beast with which we could uh, zoom on, on the road. Okay, we could zip past cars, we could have more power at the wheel, all right? And then humans like us, all of us, took to that, okay? And still are. So here's a brief uh, history of the auto industry. Okay, so early 1920s to early 1940s, General Motors, and a famous oil company brought all the street cars that were electric, okay? If you've seen the video, uh, Who Killed the Electric Car, on YouTube, if you get a chance, please take a look, okay? So they bought all these electric cars. They bought it with their own money, okay? And they dumped it. They sent it to recycle, okay? So future transportation would rely only on the automobile, not on mass transit, okay? In 1970s, in the early 1970s, uh, if you remember, or, or if you, well, if you read, you will see that it's the Arab oil embargo took place, okay? Some of us might remember, okay? Uh, few EV enthusiasts started uh, conversions, okay? So they started taking these conventional cars and started to convert it as a hobby. Started to convert normal cars into uh, hobby electric cars. Just conversion, just removing the mechanical system converting it at home as a little project, okay? So th those were EV enthusiasts, and, and few of them are my friends, okay, who live in California. Uh, it's very interesting talking to them. 
Okay, and now, in fact, it's become a business uh, proposal. Okay, conversions of cars. People are actually owning their own business and making a lot of money out of just converting con conventional cars. Okay, quite a few of my friends do it. Okay, who are gone into the corporate world and are trying uh, to uh, put research into motion. Okay, and so all of this leads to uh, gasoline conservation. However, the problem with electric cars, there's a problem, okay? Not everything is rosy. Electric cars are great, okay? What the problem, the problem here lies in, first of all, what is going to power the motor, okay? Batteries is a technology which exists, however, very limited amounts of uh, energy material that is required to make the battery pack exists, okay? The material to make the battery does not exist in North America. We like to use them for electric cars. However, the material or the chemicals or the uh, electrolytes that are needed to go into the battery pack are not made here. They're made in the Eastern countries, okay? Electronics, power electronics that needs to go to interface the battery pack with the electric motor, okay? There's research to be done there. And finally, the electric motors. Electric motors, now, how many of you are aware uh, or have studied about the electric motors that are on hybrid electric vehicles now? Do you know the Toyota Prius? Do you know about the Honda Civic Hybrid? Have you seen the Lexus SUV Hybrid? No. Okay, yeah, it's a beautiful one. Yeah, yeah you should take a look. <laughs> Four, 400H, okay, that's one of my dream cars. Okay. My wife is here attending and I've told her many times that I want to buy a Lexus SUV. <laughs> Uh, so it's in the works, um, but it, it exists. It's the 400H, the hybrid electric vehicle version of the Lexus uh, SUV. Uh, however, the motors that go on there, the motors that go on those vehicles, okay? Does anybody know? Have you read about it? Okay, they are permanent magnet machines, okay? That's all you need to know, permanent magnet machines. The motors are energized by permanent magnets. Everybody knows what permanent magnets are, right? So these permanent magnets are created with rare earth materials, okay? Now this rare earth material, okay, one of my grad students here, Manu Jain, works on permanent magnet machines and how to drive these motors, okay? Now these permanent magnet machines, the materials, the rare earth material is not available in the US or in Canada, okay? They're available in Japan, Korea, and China. Abundant amounts of permanent magnet materials are available in Japan, Korea, and China, okay? Now there's a problem. If more of the cars, I showed you the big car market in the West, okay? If you have to buy all these permanent magnets from China, okay, the economy of China goes up and that of Canada and the US goes down, okay? We become dependent on China for permanent magnets, okay? So there's a dilemma, okay? So motor design to use alternatives to permanent magnets is another research area that Concordia, where I work, we work on that, okay? We design machines to get rid of this permanent magnet business, okay? Alternatives to permanent magnet machines, okay? And how to drive them using batteries and electronics. So, the integration of all these three components is very important to propel future electric vehicles. However, we want to get rid of permanent magnets, okay? So I'm just giving you an idea. I won't go into details, but you can look up details. So let me introduce you to a few of the uh, electric vehicles, okay? Of course, the conventional vehicle drivetrain or a powertrain, as we call it in the auto industry, looks like this, okay? You have a simple fuel tank which fuels your gasoline engine, which drives the transmission, which eventually drives a pair of wheels, either the front or the rear, okay? So this is a simple conventional internal, internal combustion engine vehicle, okay? Now, if you replace this drivetrain with an all-electric drivetrain, okay, driven by a battery pack, this is how it looks. So you don't need the fuel tank, you need a battery pack now, okay? The battery pack drives a power electronic converter which drives a traction motor. Okay, traction motor is essentially a fancy word for propulsion motor or an electric motor, which drives the wheels. 
Okay? Now, if you see here, the battery pack is paralleled with a high power capacitor. Okay? Ultra, ultra capacitor. Exactly. You know about ultra capacitors. You've read about them. So yeah, this is. I have, a, I have a book about electric cars in America. That's awesome. Okay? That's good start. So an ultra capacitor is a high power density uh, capacitor, not like your normal electrolytic capacitors. Okay? So an ultra capacitor provides large amounts of power in small amounts of time. Okay? Where would you need that? When you pass a car, right? When you want to pass a car or you want to brake suddenly, okay? you need to either discharge or charge the capacitor back. Okay? When you brake, this motor acts as a generator. Okay? Now, when motor acts as a motor, it sinks power. Okay? It sucks power out of the battery pack and the capacitor. However, while braking or while going downhill, in this conventional car, you would lose that energy. You would otherwise lose it in the form of heat while braking in these wheels. Okay? Now, in an electric car, what you could do is this motor acts as a generator. Okay? It starts rotating in reverse, and you can actually generate power, from, use this energy that you would have lost otherwise in the wheels, and charge the battery pack and the capacitor pack okay, with that current. So the motor acts as a generator now. As the name suggests, you generate energy. Okay? The motor sinks energy while propelling. However, during braking events right, and going downhill, you use it as a generator. That's how hybrid electric vehicles work. Okay? The battery pack lasts longer because you charge every time you brake. Okay? So it's very conducive for city driving. In the city, you get a lot of opportunity to brake, especially in Montreal. Okay? Crazy city like Montreal, you brake a lot. Okay? Some other cities, maybe not as much. All right. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about efficiency. Okay? These are conventional cars. Different, uh, this is the engine on the rear, the engine on the front wheel. You can have an all-wheel drive with the same engine. This is conventional vehicles. Okay? All of these give you efficiencies on an average of about 20%. Okay? 20% efficient. The engine efficiency at best is about 40%, 35 to 40%. Okay? And if you consider transmission losses, etc., the actual energy available at the wheels is about 20%. Okay? So 80% of it is losses in your conventional car. Energy that is produced or the energy content in the fuel as opposed to what you actually get at the wheels. Okay? So that's a problem. Now, in a hybrid car, what do you do? In a hybrid electric vehicle, how does it become efficient? If you do simple mathematics, okay, this is very simple math. I'm not going into very complicated math, okay? I don't want to bore you to death. So here is your conventional vehicle. This is your conventional vehicle, okay? This is what your engine is doing. This is all the work that the engine is doing. You accelerate, you hit top speed, you come down, you brake, okay? This is power, by the way, <clears throat> versus time. So you brake over here, okay? There's another braking event over here. Then you accelerate again, okay? So this is your power profile over time. Let's say some random power profile, okay? So your internal combustion engine, let's say, is rated at some power, peak power of 100 kilowatts, okay? I just gave it some number, 100 kilowatts, real nice number, okay? 100 horsepower, so 100 kilowatts. The engine efficiency is about 15% efficient which corresponds to a fuel economy of 30 miles to the gallon, okay? Okay, this is about uh, an average number for a car, right? 30 miles to the gallon is an average fuel economy. Okay, now, you take the same plot, okay? Cut it into two plots. Addition, add these two plots up. I halve the engine size, okay? I downsize the engine, okay? Physically, are you, uh, are you imagining? From 100 kilowatts, I halved it to 50 kilowatts, okay? If you like horsepower, you can think in terms of horsepower, it's okay, okay? Not necessarily kilowatts, it's okay. Let's say 50 horsepower. So, here's your 50 horsepower engine. What I want the engine to do is only provide me with 50 horsepower, maximum, maximum power at all times. However, constantly, okay? It's constantly, whenever called upon, 
I want the engine to give me 50 kilowatts. All the other work, all the other work of this power shape can be done by an electric motor. Okay? So here's your electric motor with plus 50 kilowatts and negative 50 kilowatts. You add this plot and this plot, you will get this one. Do you agree? When you add this one with this, you will get a phase shifted. This plot will shift up and start from zero, right? So that's 50 kilowatts. Here's your zero slicing that plot into two. So now the motor is doing this in your, in your Toyota or a Honda or whatever, okay? Okay, they designed the hybrid electric vehicle. Hybrid, as the name suggests, is a mix of the electric motor and the engine. Okay, so you add these two plots up and you get this. Now, what's the beauty of this plot? All the dynamic work, correct? The dynamic work is being done by the electric motor. Correct? All the dynamic work is being done by the electric motor. Electric motors, guys, is very efficient. We know electric motors are 90% and up efficiency. What is efficiency? Output divided by input. Okay, so very little losses occur in the motor. The engine, as I said, is approximately 15% efficient. However, this maximum efficiency of 15 to 20% occurs when? When does the engine perform at its maximum efficiency? Only when maximum power is demanded from it. Okay, it's designed to operate at its most efficient region when maximum power is demanded from it. Okay, so what hybrid electric vehicle engineers did, they designed the engine to operate always at its maximum power. Okay, whenever called upon to assist the electric motor, the engine plugs in at 50 kilowatts from this example of ours. Okay. So directly you can double the fuel eff efficiency. You see what's happening in hybrid electric vehicles? This is what is happening, okay? So you increase the engine efficiency to about 30% at its best efficiency, okay? So always you operate it at its best efficiency. Here it was average efficiency. Now you know that you'll get the best. You've downsized it, maximum power is 50 kilowatts. Whenever it comes into play, it's always at 50 kilowatts. So you get 30%, okay? Electric motor is about 80 to 90% efficient. You get 60 miles to the gallon. That's how you get these beautiful window stickers. Toyota Prius operating at 60 miles per gallon. Honda Civic, okay? You go to the Montreal Auto Show, right? Have you been this year? Okay, so the Montreal Auto Show will show off all these cars. Okay, so that's how they get those nice numbers. And the efficiency directly doubles, okay, to about 60% efficient. That's your electric motor characteristic. It's similar to that of an engine, okay? So you can see the shape. You have uh, lower gears. You get extra force at low speeds. As you increase speed, your second gear gives you a lower torque but higher speed. And as you go higher speed, you don't need that much force, right? Torque versus speed characteristics, this is known as. Torque is what? Force, all right? You don't need a high force. At the beginning, you need a high force because you need to move the car from rest. Big inertia, you need a high force, okay? So higher, once you start gaining speed, you need lower and lower force. So the different gear levels are shown here. First gear, second gear, third, fourth, et cetera, okay? An electric motor <clears throat> displays the same characteristics inherently. It's designed for that, okay? So it has a very nice torque speed characteristics, smooth transition. You don't need all these uh, transmissions over here, okay? You don't need these transmission levels. You can smoothly uh, transit between uh, low speed and high speed and torque, okay? Yes? And these don't involve any gears, it's just straight the motor? Yes, exactly, no gears at all. So if you go back to the slide where I showed you the electric car diagram, you will see that the transmission is omitted, okay? Exactly, so the transmission is gone. So there's one less conversion stage, okay? So there's more efficiency here because you're directly connected to the axle of the wheel, okay? The main control comes from this inverter. You, the, as, as a control engineer, 
will ask the inverter to do the job of controlling the traction motor operating point on that curve. Okay? So, of course, I teach a graduate level course at Concordia on motor drives okay, that teaches you how to control the motor based on the driving requirement. All right? Along this curve. Yeah. So here's another example. This is the same thing. You shift the operating points basically from a low efficiency region to a maximum power region. This is the engine plot. Okay? So assume that we had that engine over there. We move the operating points from a low efficiency region to a high efficiency region. Okay? So you, you utilize all this regenerative braking, all this negative power. Okay? Remember I talked about this negative power. See, we split this into two, right? Negative and positive. The same plot, but now it has negative 50 kilowatts. Negative means braking. Negative power. The motor, instead of consuming power, generates. So that's why we have negative power. Okay? Where does all this go? All this negative power, where does it go? As I said, into the battery. All right? That's called regenerative braking. When you read about this fancy term, regenerative braking on websites and all that stuff, on blogs, right? In the library. In the library or in books. Okay, it's very fancy and they say it's, oh wow, regenerative braking. You know, I've heard politicians talk about it too. They don't know anything about regenerative braking. Okay, but you and I know now what actually regenerative braking means, all right? Motor acts as a generator. These are some uh, pictures, fancy pictures from actual available uh, cars. So now, have you heard about the GM Volt? General Motors came out with the Volt, yes. So that's the drivetrain of a GM Volt. Okay, it's like a series hybrid vehicle. I call it a series hybrid vehicle because the, there is a small fuel tank which only does the job of charging the battery pack through an engine. Okay, it actually doesn't contribute to, the, to powering the wheels. The GM Volt, the engine is on board, you know that. There is a little engine, but it doesn't help in propelling the wheels like in our cars now. Okay? All it does is, through the engine, it charges the battery pack through a generator of its own. Okay? And then the rest of it is an all-electric vehicle. You already saw this, the battery, the converter, the motor, and the wheels. Okay? So that's your GM Volt. Okay? So that's why I put General Motors courtesy over there. You can check this out. Uh, that's your uh, Honda Civic or Honda Insight. Okay, the first ever hybrid electric vehicle which was designed by Honda. Okay, I like this picture a lot because it shows windmills in conjunction with a hybrid electric vehicle. Okay, in the future when we go into charging of electric vehicles, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, how do you charge the batteries on board? Okay, yeah, of course, now you, ch now you charge from the grid. Okay, there has been proposals by Hydro-Quebec, you charge from the grid. But you did? Yeah. Okay, so now all the Jean Coutus and everything are gonna come out with these charge ports, okay? Where you can give your, bring your electric cars, park, and charge, okay? But you need to pay to Hydro-Quebec. Now, imagine you have your own solar panel or your own wind panel, freely available electricity, okay? Installation costs, I agree, is, is there. You have to install it. <laughs> it's not gonna come from God, okay? You need to install it, okay? And then, you have your own electricity to charge your own electric car, okay? That's the beauty of research. Electrical engineering, okay, will give you this option of charging your electric car from renewable energy sources, okay? So uh, that's a lot of my, my research deals with that, okay? Uh, recently, I've got funding from the government for, for this purpose, okay? And the government is supporting such ideas, okay? So most of you who, are, who want to go into engineering, must think of this option very seriously, okay? It, it's a practical dilemma, as I, produ I, as I show, introduced to you. The solution lies in renewable energy, but how do you utilize it? And how do you marry these two technologies of electric vehicles and renewable energy is the key, okay, to research. That's like, uh, that's like uh, how do you say, uh, heaven for electrical engineers, when you marry these two technologies. Uh, this is the uh, famous Toyota Prius uh, vehicle. I'm not going to go into details. It's a parallel. It's a, a parallel and series hybrid electric vehicle. It combines the two. Okay, so you have the electric motor and the fuel tank, which both both of them can help propel the vehicle. Okay, so that's uh, a picture of, courtesy of Toyota. 
Okay? So you can see that there's a power assist type of hybrid electric vehicle to a range extender type of hybrid electric. HEV is hybrid electric vehicle, by the way. Okay? It's an, just an acronym. HEV, hybrid electric vehicle. Okay? So you can have a wide range depending on the power level of the motor. If it's an all electric vehicle, you're going towards the range extender type of vehicle. You know the Nissan Leaf or the Mitsubishi, uh, my EV. Okay, they are all electric, no gasoline engine at all. Okay, so and there's. The Nissan Leaf, it's all electric. It's all electric, completely electric. Completely electric Nissan Leaf. The Mitsubishi, my EV is also completely electric. Okay, MI EV. Okay, and, and these were uh, displayed last year when I visited the Montreal Auto Show. For sure, they'll, it'll be displayed again. Okay. Here's your electric car. Okay, shows you a, a, with an integrated starter alternator kind of a design where you can use the electric machine to start your car as well. Okay, so there's some fancy designs with four wheel drives. Okay, you have your electric, you could have engine on the back, okay, on the rear vehicle, on, on the rear uh, axle, and you can have the electric traction on the front axle. This is a hybrid electric vehicle also. Okay, this is a design. For those of you who want to open a business, startup company of your own, let's say, moving forward, okay, you already have your engine on one of the axles. If you want to retrofit it, if you want to retrofit it with an electric machine, you can very well do it on the front axle. Okay? So you can sell this kit, a conversion kit, for let's say $3,000, $5,000, okay? and you can make it a hybrid electric vehicle. Okay, so you can have a controller on board. You can control the uh, engine operation as and when you require at constant power and do all the dynamic work with the electric machine, as I explained earlier. So this is a business proposal. You could do that. Okay, or you can make it an all-electric four-wheel drive. So these are fully hybridized vehicles. <coughs> I can provide you with the slides later if, if you know, for, uh, for your um, per usual. Okay. Uh, these are some through-the-road hybrids. So this is a through-the-road hybrid, okay? You couple the machine with the other machine through the road, right? Both the wheels are on the road. How are you, gonna, how are you going to couple the torques? You need to couple the, the force of this machine with, with this machine here, the integrated starter alternator. How do you couple the two? Okay, usually we have some belt, some kind of a belt, right? But here in this case, we have the road. Okay, the, the rear wheel and the front wheels they are coupled through the road, so both the machines can be controlled through a controller. Okay, so that's a great idea for through the road hybrid. And Dodge Durango came up with a through the road hybrid SUV. Okay, the Dodge Durango is the first hybrid SUV which is through the road hybrid. Okay, so these are some other listings of uh, releases of electric vehicle, hybrid electric vehicles from General Motors, Lexus, Dodge. Of course, the, the Honda Insight was the first one, with, followed by the Toyota Prius. However, the Toyota Prius was the first ever hybrid electric vehicle in Japan, okay? Released in 1997, okay? Way back when, okay? Then, there's this alternative, which is um, the fuel cell vehicle. Now, how many of you are aware, uh, aware of fuel cells? You know about fuel cells? Fuel cells, fuel cells, yes, okay? Now, fuel cells use hydrogen, okay? This is a whole different ball game. All electric vehicles is great. Fuel cell vehicles is another beast, okay? Fuel cells vehicles are complete, completely different. They, need, they, don't know, they don't need electricity. They create electricity on their own. However, the input is hydrogen. Now, where are you gonna get hydrogen from, okay? So here's a fuel cell. We'll talk a little bit about the dilemma of uh, achieving hydrogen in a little bit. But here's the principle of operation of a fuel cell. It, just, it looks just like a battery. It, it looks just like a battery, right? You agree with me? It has an anode and a cathode. For those of you who have seen battery alkaline cells, you, so you have two electrodes. You have your electrolyte, okay, for the conduction. Your fuel input goes to the cathode, okay? You have another input in the form of oxygen or air at the anode, and the, and the electrolyte interacts with these and produces electricity and an exhaust in the form of water, okay? So it's a, it's a very clean energy source, okay? 
uh, the people who, uh, who uh, propose uh, fuel cells claim this, that it is a very clean energy source. Okay? You have only water and power as the uh, output. So it's very clean. It's understood. However, the cost is the key issue now. Currently, getting hydrogen is not as efficient as gasoline or diesel for our cars. All right? Actually extracting hydrogen is one issue. Then, transporting it to the fuel station. You'll need to fuel it somewhere, right? Okay, so it needs to be transported into the cities, like Montreal. Where are you going to fuel it? You need a hyd hydrogen gas station, okay? So that transmission of hydrogen is highly costly because it's hydrogen, you need to carry it safely in pipelines, etc. Okay, so that's another problem. So these are some practical issues with hydrogen cars. However, you can create hydrogen on board the car, okay? Chemical engineers have come up with ways to use gasoline, natural gas, methanol, ethanol, which are freely available fuels, not as harmful as hydrogen, but they need a device known as a fuel reformer. As the name suggests, it reforms all of these hydrogen-rich gases into a pure hydrogen gas. Okay, these are hydrogen-rich gases. They are not hydrogen. They are hydrogen-rich. Okay, yes? Yes, you can put a reformer on the car, so you can go to your normal gas station, fuel it, the reformer on board converts it to hydrogen, and then it feeds it to the fuel cell, which is on board. Oh yeah, this is more efficient. I'm gonna talk about efficiency in a little bit. Okay. How efficient is this? That's a very good question. The complete fuel cycle efficiency, people can talk about using hydrogen, you can talk about electricity, you can talk about so many energy sources, but how efficient is it is the key, right? That's when you pay. The cost comes in when you talk about how efficient is that system. Okay, so we'll take a look in a little bit. How efficient is this process using a reformer on board? Okay, so here it is. Here's the slide, just as you said. Yes. Uh, no. No, gasoline is easier. Right now, gasoline is about 98% efficient to get from crude oil. You lose only 2%. The technology is so advanced, it's a well-known process. We can get gasoline very readily from crude oil. Except when we run out of crude oil. Crude oil. Where will we start getting gasoline? Exactly. That's the question. That's why I'm here. That's why we are talking about electric cars today. I know. Okay, so see, that's the thing. That's the thought process. That is, that is the correct thought, the thought process. Okay, we need to start thinking. All of us need to start thinking like you. Okay? And not just us in this room. We need to go out and spread the good word. Okay. Something else. Yes. Is there another way? To, is there another way? Is there another law? Um, is there another way to get some hydrogen from hydrogen-rich gases other than using natural gas, gasoline, methanol, and ethanol? Are there other ways? Well, See, I'm not... Kinds of hydrogen -rich there, gas could be, there could be, there could be, there could be, there could be. You can also produce hydrogen by electrolysis of water, Ooh. which yeah. you can use an electrolyzer, okay, which consists of water, and you can power this electrolyzer from renewable energy at home, let's say. So you can produce hydrogen and oxygen. You can split the water, right? It's H2O, right? Yeah. You can split you can hydrogen split it and, then recombine it. and recombine it. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? Yeah. We'll work on that project, okay? <laughs> I'll send you my email address, okay? <laughs> and we can work on that cool project with solar power at your home, okay? So we'll recombine it and then, but you build a uh, fuel cell car, okay? I'll do the electrolyzer part. I'll do the easy part, you do the tough part. Okay, uh, let's continue on. We're running short on time, right? We have the room till two o'clock? Yeah, we're good. We're okay? We're rolling? Okay. Uh, fuel cell vehicles, okay, great. Uh, where were we? Efficiency, good question. Efficiency, right? So here's your efficiency numbers. So fuel reformer, fuel tank has hydrogen, 
you pass it into a fuel reformer, which converts it into uh, a well, hydrogen-rich gas, goes into a fuel reformer, converts it to hydrogen, which goes into a fuel cell, okay? So that's 80% right there. 80% efficient, maximum efficiency, okay, I'm talking about. Fuel cell is 60% efficient. So you, you, as you go along, you're losing some power at every conversion stage. You agree? So these are maximum efficiency numbers that I've put down from references, from chemical engineering journals and papers, etc. Okay, I'm not a chemical engineer. I'm an electrical engineer. I use this stuff. Okay, but these numbers come from those journals. Okay, if you might want to read it up. So as you move along, you take the products. At the end, you get about the 30% efficient vehicle. Okay, 30% efficient vehicle, which is just about the number as we have for the gasoline engine. Okay, 30%. Okay, so now what happened? You have a very clean, efficient car, but not as efficient as you want it to be. It's just as efficient as your car today. You know, it's just as efficient. It's cleaner, I agree, but it's just as efficient. So cost is the key. Okay, low efficiency means high cost. Okay, so here's your fuel cell, so here's your internal combustion efficiency. Fuel cell efficiency is over here in the red plot. So you have low power, high efficiency, about 60% efficient. That's what fuel cell uh, promoters talk about when they talk about fuel cell. So the Bush administration in the US, when, the, when George Bush was the president, he funded General Motors millions of dollars for fuel cell research. Millions, countless amounts, billions maybe even, okay, for fuel cell research. They sold this idea that it's about 60% efficient, okay, compared to your engine, which is only 20% efficient, and it has no emissions, okay? So it was great. However, nobody told them that it was for a car, fuel cell to power a car. Now, where do you usually, do you operate in a low power region? Your car doesn't need to operate in a low power region. It needs to operate in a high power region, in a range of power in the higher scale, okay? So now when you see the efficiency curve of a fuel cell, it actually tails off. As the power becomes more and more, the efficiency curve tails off, okay? And they tend to meet the internal combustion engine blue plot. That's what I just said, right? When you actually combine the efficiencies of all the transformations of power done, you actually come up with an efficiency of the engine. Okay, so fuel cells may be good in the low power region for portable devices, I don't know, like laptops or cell phones, etc. However, for propelling cars, I don't think so. Personally, I don't think so, and I do not promote hydrogen research. Okay, hydrogen is also dangerous. I saw a video once of a hydrogen car blow up, versus a gasoline car blow up, okay? They try to show that hydrogen is very light, so it blows up faster, okay? Than the gasoline, which keeps burning. But then you pick your, it's, it's basically, uh, 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 you pick your poison, right? You want to die fast or you want to die slow, <laughs> okay? But hydrogen is pretty dangerous, it's very combustible, okay? So don't play around with hydrogen at home, yes? Where will we get the electric power? Yeah, because most of it runs on oil or coil. Exactly. So we're trying to avoid that. Exactly. So, so th th I'm coming to that point. I'm going to come to how do you generate power by uh, uh, re renewable energy, okay? We're going to talk about that cool, exciting stuff. This is a hybrid fuel cell vehicle where uh, fuel cell companies, uh, like General Motors fuel cell automotive companies, have come up with, uh, with, with an actual design with batteries on board, okay? So they supplement the fuel cell with a battery pack in parallel to increase the efficiency slightly, making it a hybrid electric vehicle, again, just like the hybrid electric uh, Toyota Prius, with, instead of a gasoline engine, you have a fuel cell engine, okay? With a battery pack. So now the efficiency becomes slightly higher, just like a hybrid vehicle, okay? So there are challenges in fuel cells, like I said, infrastructure, onboard hydrogen, performance, range of operation, Okay, how many kilometers you can drive, et cetera. Startup time of fuel cells, they're not very short. You have to wait till this fuel cell warms up so that you get good efficiency. Okay, that's a problem. 
dynamics, interaction between the fuel cell and the batteries and the power electronics and the drives on board, etc. Okay, in the end, really, is it really worthwhile? It's too expensive, at least for now, okay? Let the chemical engineers do their job. Let them give us an, a, a nice product for vehicles, then I can come into play. Like, I can use that as an electrical engineer. I can use that like a battery, okay? But currently, I cannot use fuel cells as a battery. Okay, it's very difficult, it's too expensive. So fuel cells are not economic, economically feasible. Even if they are practical, their overall efficiency is less than that of hybrid electric vehicles. So this is what we discovered already. Okay, so fuel cells really uh, are, are a dilemma. So hybrid electric vehicles or all electrics are really cost effective. I talked about a conversion kit idea. Okay, so here's a table with gasoline price $2 per gallon in the US. And if you assume that you drive about 12,000 miles a year, okay, so you can see the annual savings per year if you convert your conventional vehicle into a hybrid vehicle with 25% improvement, hybridization, or you increase it by 50%, all electric driving range with a, with a larger electric motor. Okay, so I put down costs over here per year and your payback periods. Okay, so this is a conversion kit idea. Those of you who want to go ahead and start your own businesses in the future can think about electric conversions, okay? Increasing gas prices, uh, payback period is even faster, okay? So these are tables that show you that with the numbers, okay? So uh, these are conversion kits. This is a conversion kit idea, as I said, with an all-electric, okay? Now, benefits of electric vehicles, all-electric vehicles, okay? So here's your electricity, uh, electricity mix in North America. Most of it comes from coal in the US, okay? Um, you have petroleum, you have natural gas, you have hydroelectric, most of it comes from Canada, okay? Quebec, we have hydro, okay? All of our power, most of it in fact, is hydro, correct? It's clean. Exactly, hydro-Quebec, right? <laughs> so, so it's clean, it's good for us, okay? So we are already good. We are good. However, the US, most of it is coal, okay? So emissions occur at the well itself, the fuel well, where you're getting electricity from. Emissions occur there, okay? So it's very bad for them. There's, they also have nuclear, 22% nuclear. So this is, a, this is the whole pie showing how electricity is produced. Let's take a look at operating cost for a little bit. So gasoline vehicles, currently, the operating cost is about 11 cents per mile of driving, okay? If you do the math, for electric vehicles, it makes sense. It's only two, do two cents per mile. And in Quebec, even lesser. You know how much you pay for electricity, right? How much do you pay per unit? Six cents? Six cents per unit. You know what is a unit? Kilowatt hours. Okay? Power multiplied by time. The energy. Okay? It's known as a unit. So you pay six cents for a unit, okay? Six cents for a unit is some of the cheapest rates in the world, okay? It might well have been free. It could well have been free. Doesn't make a difference to Hydro-Quebec. What we're paying is five and a half to six cents, okay? So electric vehicles charge from that electricity. Okay, your, to answer your question, electric vehicles charge from electricity because there are batteries on board. You need to charge them, okay? Even so, operating costs in cents per mile is about two cents, okay? Here's the fuel costs, okay? Five dollars, uh, five cents to about 10 cents per mile for gasoline vehicles, for electric vehicles, anywhere between one to two uh, cents, okay? Again, a big gap makes sense, okay? So these are just some of the benefits, other benefits of electric vehicles. Most of all, they are green, okay? And that's the theme of today. We're talking about green, uh, sustainable environment, okay? Most of all, all electric vehicles, EVs, are green vehicles, okay? Now here's a nice idea. So you have your home, okay? You have your grid powering your home. You, in your backyard, you could have a charge port, okay? When you come home from work, it's your green vehicle, so I colored it green. Okay, uh, so your green vehicle comes home, you charge in your parking lot, okay? The charging times usually vary depending upon the current that you draw 
from the charger. Okay? If it's a high current charging system, okay, you can charge it in about in less than an hour, 45 minutes. Okay? If it's a, it's a low current or level one type of charging, you can charge in anywhere between six to eight hours. So overnight charging is possible also. Okay? Six to eight hours is more practical to start with. Hydro-Quebec has already uh, implemented this kind of a charging system. Okay? They've built chargers which can charge from the grid right now from their system okay, in your home in about six to eight hours. Okay? The Nissan Leaf, like I said, has this option already. You can charge the battery pack in six to eight hours. Okay? Now, I talked about fast charging, right? Less than 45 minutes. But do you, none of you asked me the question, what about the battery pack on the car? Can it take that high current? Right now, they cannot. Right now, battery companies, manufacturers, are working on such systems. Okay? Today, I have in place an idea. I can provide you with an idea for a charge station. Okay? Students in my research group at Concordia have already designed this system. But battery packs don't exist. Today I have an idea. But battery packs don't exist. Okay? So battery companies need to do work on that. Okay? So different levels of charging. This is a charging system and the electronics that goes into uh, the charging system between the battery pack and the AC input. So there's a lot of power electronics, as you can see. Okay? At Concordia, I teach a course also on power electronics, how to interface AC grid systems with DC systems like battery packs or renewable energy systems. Okay? Here's the hours to fully charge a battery. You can have 8 to 14 hours, very slow level, level 1. I talked about 6 to 8 hours. Okay? That falls under level 2 charging. This is feasible today. Okay? Level, three, uh, level 1 and 2 are feasible today with small amounts of current. Level 3, as I said, in about half an hour, 15 minutes to 45 minutes. Okay? You can have these time slots, 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, depending on the current levels. Okay? So this would normally be, you cannot do this at home anyway. Okay? You'd be frying eggs in the uh, refrigerator of your neighbor. Okay? You, you have this high current in your backyard, your neighbors will complain to the city okay, that you're frying all the items in their house. Okay? That current produces a lot of electromagnetic interference. Okay? So, so, so the neighboring electric uh, appliances get affected. These kind of levels of current and fast charging can take place at gas stations, what, replacing gas stations with charge stations. Yes? So what level of current are we talking about? Uh, 200 amps, 250 amps. Coal and nuclear is not really clean. You, you, exactly, neither is petroleum. Okay? So these are, the only clean one here is hydroelectric. And that's us. We are contributing to this chart quite a bit. Okay? 11% of North American mix of generation electricity. As you know, Hydro-Quebec is a rich uh, entity. Okay? We sell a lot of power to the US and clean. So we generate it through water. So it's a good thing to promote electric cars here. And Quebec is one of the leaders in electric car um, uh, industry, okay? especially in electricity generation, clean electricity generation. Okay? This is the electronics in the car. We already talked about it. However, there's a charge port over here now to charge from the electricity. We already saw this, right? We already saw this stage. We saw the converter and the charger, the battery that charges from the grid, and finally we saw the electric motor, everything goes in here, okay? We already saw these slides earlier. So I'm not gonna repeat that. So everything is the same, except that now you have a battery charger to charge the battery pack, okay? Rest of the drivetrain is the same. You could have a hybrid electric car, you could have a hybrid electric car, just as before, but you can have a plug-in option for the battery. You call it a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, PHEV. Okay? Many third-party uh, companies, just like people like you and me, have started their own business enterprises, just building charger kits to charge the battery on board okay? from the grid. So that's an option. That was a parallel HEV with the engine and the motor in parallel driving the wheels. You could have a series HEV, just like the GM Volt, I talked about the GM Volt, right? Where the engine charges the battery pack, okay? And then the battery pack does the powering of the motor. The engine doesn't propel the wheels directly. That's a GM Volt. It also has a plug-in option. 
the General Motors Volt comes with a plug-in option. You can charge the battery pack. Okay? So when you charge the battery pack, you don't have to use the engine as much. You can directly work as an electric car. Okay? You can see the power flow, right? I'm using the laser pointer, just follow that. Okay? Not too tough, right? Okay. Good. Uh, fuel cells. Now, we talked about electrolysis, right? Electrolyzer. You can have a plug-in fuel cell car. You can plug it in and you can electrolyze the fuel on board. Okay, the water on board, split it into hydrogen, oxygen, and use it for a regenerative fuel cell. Okay, rest of it is an all-electric car supplemented with a battery pack. It's a parallel hybrid electric vehicle, but you can use a recharger or an electrolyzer to split the water that is coming out into hydrogen and oxygen and feeding the cathode and anode and run it as an electric car. That is also a cool idea, right? Okay, so you come home, you split it at home. You collect the water, split it, and you recharge the fuel cell. I am in the team to charge electric cars using solar power. Okay, so solar power is abundantly available. Okay, so you have charging. Uh, what I have proposed uh, more recently is, 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 a, is a parking lot powered with solar panels. Okay, each of these parking lots have charging mats. Okay. So this is a comp these uh, parking slots have uh, the capability of contactless charging. If the car comes in, you can charge from it. You don't need to connect anything, okay? You just charge, okay? You have a battery on board, it charges. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to do a thing. You just close your door and go. Nothing to follow a pacemaker or anything? Nothing, you don't connect anything, nothing, okay? It'll charge automatically. Okay, so this is a, is, is a charge mat. I call it a charge mat, okay? It is contactless, wireless charging, okay? While the car is away, the solar power is basically charging this mat, okay? It's providing energy to charge the mat. Sol solar is free. Solar you don't have to pay for. Solar is right there. It's always available, okay? So you, the only cost is the installation and the electronics between the solar and the charge mat. Okay. The other option is if you don't want to use your charge mat, you can use solar directly to charge the battery. It's already DC. You just charge the, the, the pack okay, with a wire. So you have your wire option and you have a wireless option. Okay. So we've already designed the electronics for that. Everything is in place. Uh, demonstration should be in a year or two. Okay. So you, I invite all of you, you can anytime take a walk down and just come and take a look. Okay, we can have coffee and stuff. Okay, cool, donuts maybe. All right, uh, the other one is residential. So this is very commercial. This is gonna be downtown uh, Concordia University, a uh, lot of uh, advertisement, you know, nice parking lot, everything. Uh, we can also do the same at your home, okay? You could have a so solar panels installed on the roof of your home, okay, and charge your electric car. So you don't have to pay the utility anymore. First of all, the electricity is clean. You see? As opposed to the electricity mix that I showed you, nuclear, coal, generating electricity at all those spots and getting power into the, into the wall, it costs a lot. Okay? And you emit at the uh, source. Right? Through coal, through nuclear, through petroleum. You emit emissions, harmful emissions into the atmosphere with clean renewable energy like solar, okay, you don't have that issue. You're creating electricity at home, first of all, you're not paying for all the transmission, etc. It's right at your source. Same thing with a commercial building or a commercial parking lot, okay? And it's clean. So costly, uh, uh, cost-wise, you're not really paying more, okay? And it's cleaner and greener. So here's a little power system. So we've built this uh, power electronic inverter charger, as I explained to you. It's a lot of power electronics, a lot of research goes into it, a lot of control systems, a lot of math, most of which you are studying, okay? Uh, when you come into university, you study how to apply these in real life, okay? And of course, applying these to, uh, to save the future, okay? So that our kids can see a, a sustainable transportation future that is uh, definitely worth it, okay? So, 
think about it. So this is some of the uh, options. I don't want to bore you with the text. You know, uh, these green uh, bullets actually show you the solar carport with electric vehicle charging advantages. Okay, so these are some arrangements. That's the best car I could draw. I'm not an artist. I'm an engineer. Okay, so that's my little car charging from DC-DC converters from solar panels and the grid. Okay, so this is a power system layout of, 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 of a car. These are houses with different blocks. Okay, so even houses can share power through a little mini grid. This is a mini grid or a micro grid within your locality in your area of homes. Okay, and so power can be shared between homes. Okay, these are battery packs. Lithium ion battery packs that go on board. Like I said, lithium is the uh, battery of choice, okay, right now because of energy densities for electric cars. Now, lithium is not re readily available in North America. That's a dilemma that I told you right at the beginning of the lecture, right? Lithium is available in the East, okay, China, etc. cetera. Um, Jesse Ventura, you know Jesse Ventura? How many of you know Jesse Ventura? Wrestler, right? Yeah. Uh, he was also uh, governor of Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. Yeah, Minnesota for a while. Uh, and he mentioned on Piers Morgan, you see the show, Piers Morgan, CNN? Okay, so Piers Morgan was uh, interviewing Jesse Ventura and he claims that there's a lot of this in Afghanistan. Lithium, okay? Lithium is available in Afghanistan. Okay, so uh, US has a lot of interest in Afghanistan, as you know, okay? So lithium is available in the East in general Okay, you need to bring lithium to the US. So now battery packs and research on batteries is also important. Okay, just like motors, permanent magnets are available in China. Same thing with lithium battery packs. It's all well and good for now. They work. Nissan Leaf uses lithium ion battery pack. Mitsubishi uses the lithium battery pack. It's great. It looks beautiful. We go to the auto show and, and, and we admire those things. But then the problem is to sustain it we need a lot of research, okay? Creating batteries, creating motors, and the electronics. Remember the three elements that I wrote in red a few slides back, okay? You need to charge these lithium ion battery packs, okay? This is charging. It's like filling buckets of water. These are cells of batteries connected in series, okay? The problem with lithium battery packs is that they don't charge evenly, okay? They are very weak cells. So they tend to overcharge or undercharge. Okay, here's the effect of, uh, oh, the media player doesn't work, eh? Overcharging. I had a video of an overcharging cell. Okay, so the idea is to share the charge. This is what we do with cell equalization. So we have a product that we built at Concordia to share the uh, charge amongst the cells, okay? This is again done through, so yeah, okay, so we shared the charges in the extra capacity cells using uh, uh, power electronics. So this is a converter, power electronic converter that was built in-house in order to put on board electric cars, okay? So this does uh, charging. So you have microcontrollers, you have uh, power electronic switches, you have inductors, most of you must have read about these elements on board, okay? And then you have your uh, port that is connects to the to battery cells, which are in series. So you can connect each of these boards for five cells, okay? And if you make it cost effective, then you're in business, okay? So you're a great businessman if you can make cell equalizers for electric cars. Cars are coming, electric cars are coming, okay? Anything that you can do for cars, that's great. This is a motor drive. Remember I talked about replacing permanent magnets, permanent magnet machines? This is a switched reluctance machine. It uses no magnets at all. Okay, no magnets, just iron, no magnets. Okay, so we've built a power electronic drive for that. Uh, this is PMSM, but re reduction of uh, converter switches. Okay, all these switches are lined up to, to, uh, to power each of these motors. Okay, so we've managed to eliminate two of these switches, which are costly, okay? So, so Manu here, Manu Jain, my grad student, his thesis topic deals with this. So he's the guy who reduced the converter size and powered two, uh, v, uh, uh, two uh, machines which can run in wheels, okay? You can install these machines in the wheels of the car, okay? 
So any, any questions about that, you can ask Manu, because I don't know anything about it. <laughs> okay. Um, there are some student projects that we did. We converted a Montreal uh, 139 PNUF uh, route uh, bus into, into an all-electric. Okay. So this was the drive cycle that we came up with for the PNUF bus route. We've converted bicycles into electrics. Okay. These are all capstone projects for final year undergraduate students that work with me. This is a rowboat. Uh, we are creating a boat uh, with a solar uh, system on board and a battery pack that can row across the Atlantic. Self-powered boat, okay? So those are some of the highlights uh, so far about what we do at Concordia, okay? We, uh, these are some highlights that uh, I would like to point out. We have a world-class power electronics lab. I invite all of you to come and take a look, okay? We have electric motor drives and EV propulsion laboratory in place. Okay, it's one of the first labs of its kind in Canada. You must come take a look. Uh, we also offer courses, okay, we teach. There are two other professors, Professor Luis Lopez and uh, Professor Pragasen Pillay. He's the senior Hydro-Quebec research chair uh, and myself. Uh, we teach amongst us 12 courses. Now 12 co courses constitutes a full program almost okay, on sustainable energy, okay, so that's again uh, the best program that at least that I know of in Canada amongst universities, leading universities, okay, uh, so the list includes uh, power electronics courses, motor drives courses, uh, control systems, electric vehicles, renewable energy, electric machines design, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that you need to know, so most of our courses and, and, and uh, research efforts are focused directly to uh, to what the industry needs, okay? So engineers coming out of Concordia actually satisfy these needs, okay? Of course, the enrollment obviously is very high. We have about 100 plus students consistently in our classes, okay? As I said, we target the industry. Uh, in the next five years, I, uh, personally, I feel that the program will grow exponentially, okay? If you guys uh, uh, decide to go with engineering and, and join Concordia, then that will assist the cause, obviously. Um, and of course, I can safely say that uh, Concordia is the top ranked university in terms of sustainable uh, green en energy uh, education. Okay, so, so, so just to wrap up, let's just uh, give a little fuel for thought. Okay, SUVs, I talked about SUVs today, right? Okay, these are the status symbol. Okay, think about it. By using PHEVs, all of us can keep our big cars but use less fuel. Okay, that's an option. Plug in hybrid electric vehicles. Top five contributors to greenhouse gases in the world, US, China, Russia, Japan, and number five, road vehicles in North America. Okay? Just uh, some ideas to think about. Okay? So recuperation, as I said, talk about, uh, talking about uh, payback period for installing. If gas prices increase, uh, you can recoup the price within a year or two. Currently, it's about three to four years once you install an electric drive on board, okay? Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's family owns four Priuses. That's a fact. David Duchovny, Bill Meha, they also own Priuses, okay? So uh, just think about this. If all the vehicles in North America today use flex fuel plug-in hybrid vehicles, the total requirement for liquid fuel for transportation would be only a mere 20% of what we use today. That is massive. Mm -hmm. That is massive, okay? So very soon, we'll either be driving all electric vehicles, biofuel vehicles, or riding on one of these. So you think about it, <laughs> okay? This is also zero emissions, no doubt, okay? But think about it. So thank you for your attention, guys. Sorry for going on board. Thank you.